Savvy Business Radio, drawing out the best from our guests with your host, Christina Nitschman. Get ready October 7th in Hackensack, New Jersey, live to lead a unique John Maxwell Company leadership development experience designed to equip you with new perspectives, practical tools, and key takeaways. Their speakers include Dr. John Maxwell himself, Simon Sinek, Liz Wiseman, and Dan Cathy. Get your tickets today at l2l.johnmaxwell.com slash finder and enter the word Hackensack. Hello everyone and welcome to Savvy Business Radio. This is your host, Christina Nitschman. Each week on Savvy, we host successful individuals and business owners, inviting them to share their dreams, stories, wisdom, and gifts with the world. Our first guest today is Dr. D. Anthony Miles. He shares how to take the fear factor out of entrepreneurial risk. Our second guest is Taylor Hay. Shares his extraordinary journey to building his hugely successful fitness business, Synergetics. Find out more about Dr. D'Anthony Miles at mdicorpventures.com and find out more about Taylor Hay and Synergetics at pocketgym.com. Hi, D'Anthony. How are you? Welcome to Savvy Business Radio. How are you, Christina? How are you today? So glad to be here. You betcha. I'm very, very, very happy to have you here. Uh, we were introduced by a mutual friend and PR extraordinaire, Susie, at Susie Radio, and I'm so grateful that she introduced us because you are doing phenomenal work helping entrepreneurs reduce risk. As we both know, a lot of entrepreneurs and small businesses do not make it to year five. You're here helping them get past year five and be extraordinarily successful. How did you get into doing the work you're doing now? Well, I got into the work uh, when I was working on my uh, doctor work. I was intrigued by entrepreneurship, and I was intrigued by business failure. And mm -hmm. uh, I actually presented at a conference in 2009. I was uh, interested in, uh, well, what if I could detect risk patterns before the business gets started? Maybe I could help people not prevent failure or minimize failure. So uh, I uh, performed and uh, conducted some research I've been conducting on a matrix called the ERO, Entrepreneurial Risk Orientation Matrix. Mm -hmm. And I got, I, it was actually a side project what I was originally going to do my doctor work on. So I did not, I was not prepared for the response that I got from the audience. They loved it. It mm. was uh, just a uh, great thing. So I said, I need to pursue this. So I got into studying businesses and looking at risk patterns and that's how that's how I came up with the study in entrepreneurship and study with startup companies mm -hmm. and what have you noticed mostly from your business that really causes a good portion of businesses to go under oh goodness where do I start <laughs> <laughs> so many so many <laughs> yeah. I'll give you I'll give you one word market okay. saturation really? uh, Mm -hmm. Yeah, most entrepreneurs, and this is really a tragedy, most entrepreneurs, when they do a startup venture, they mm -hmm. tend to do startups in industries where they're already either worked in or have worked in, and mm -hmm. those industries are usually not the best industries for a startup because those markets are already saturated, and the uh, leader of the market is mm -hmm. the incumbent. So by the time you try to start a business, he's already established uh, mm -hmm. barriers to entry, like it may be uh, you have to deal with government policy. Mm -hmm. You can't just start a business. You have to have licensing involved. Mm -hmm. So that's, those are some of the things that I've noticed with a lot of entrepreneurs. They tend to start businesses in mm -hmm. industries that are not the best for startups. Mm. And I'm, I've heard a lot of people say, hey, I just started my business because I love whatever it is. One, one guy I talked to, he, he loved drawing maps for fun, and he was doing it on his own, and then, you know, he was creating these wonderful maps, and then people were like, hey, I, I want one, and so he started doing it for friends and vice versa for my friend who does jewelry. So often, I, I, either it comes through a necessity, I have this problem in my life, and here's how I can solve it because it's not out there, and that's great because it doesn't exist, mm -hmm. or you have the entrepreneur who says, hey, I'm really good at this. People seem to like what I have, whether it be cookies or sewing or whatever, and I'm going to make a business out of it. But the problem is, as you mentioned, sometimes there's a lot of people doing that already. How do you get yourself noticed and make, the, I guess, the proper noise or attention that you get noticed amongst all the other people doing what you're doing? 
Well, there's old saying, I'll leave a sound bite with you, all businesses are guilty until proven innocent. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, there's a distinction between a hobby and a, and a business venture. And some people mistake a business venture or mistake a hobby for a business venture. And mm. most of the time, uh, like your example that you gave, uh, mm -hmm. if, you're, if that's your passion, and, mm -hmm. well, if you're going to do that as a, as a serious business and, you know, you have to obviously look at your business model, you need to find gaps in mm -hmm. people that are already doing that. Say, case in point, you ever, you ever heard of the company called Build-A-Bear, right? They're in the malls. Yes. Most malls, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. Build-A-Bear did not in, reinvent how to do stuffed animals. They just had a really unique business model, and they found a niche or found a gap in the marketplace, which was, what if we put the manufacturing, we put it in the mall, and people can mass customize any type of stuffed animal they have, and we could provide them a basic template to do that. And mm -hmm. voila, there you have Build-A-Bear. Well, mm -hmm. Build-A-Bear reinvent the industry? To an extent it did. But however, Build-A-Bear did find a gap in the marketplace. What if we mm -hmm. take people that can build their own stuffed animal, and they can, you know, customize it, put everything they want on it, you know, take it with them. Now, you can, usually you couldn't do that. So that's what, I would, that's what I would say to people that have a passion for, say, a hobby slash business venture. Find a gap, and you want to be able to see if you can exploit that gap and uh, put your name on it and niche it. Mm. And what would you say to anyone getting started? Say they have this hobby and they're thinking, okay, I want to take it and launch it. I'm going to start looking for that gap. What would be your advice for them getting started besides finding the, the gap uh, in the industry they want to get into? Is there anything else they should be aware of? I don't want to sound cliche, you know, because I, <laughs> I, people say do a business plan. I actually do something that I use with my clients. It's called a business plan now. And I help people as they go through the business. I go, oh, we're going to plot. This is what you need to do. But for mm -hmm. uh, to answer your question, when somebody mm -hmm. wants to do that, uh, again, find your gaps. Find out who the competitors are. Find, mm -hmm. See if you can minimize your competition by focusing on a, a, a niche that hasn't been addressed by the competition. And mm -hmm. uh, my, I'm actually writing a, a fourth book called Opportunity Theory. And Ooh, I, I like talk that. about those things, yes, and I'll definitely come back on the show. I'm actually working out with a publisher, and mm -hmm. the book primarily picks up where risk factors and business models, my mm -hmm. current book uh, picks up. It picks mm -hmm. up after that, and it show, I'm going I'm to show entrepreneurs how to spot opportunities and exploit mm -hmm. those opportunities. So the key mm -hmm. is finding the gaps, see the opportunity before anybody else does, and then uh, take advantage of it and execute yeah, and that's not a bad thing. That's what makes small business awesome because uh -huh. there is an opportunity there for if, there, if there's a really difficult situation going on right now, you could be the person that makes life better for people. You could turn it you could turn it around for them, even if it's a really bad economy. And I'd heard one uh, business lecturer say that you know people were like, "Oh, it's a bad economy right now for me to get started in something." He's like, "No, this is a perfect opportunity. If if the economy is low or having difficulty, that's your opportunity to see where is people's greatest need and how can you fix it." Oh, Christina, you, uh, you, hit, you hit that right on the head. Uh, absolutely. <laughs> you have to almost be a contrarian to be an entrepreneur. You know, it's like mm -hmm. you have to go against the tide. I don't necessarily mean go against the grain all the time, but yeah. when everybody does this, you do mm -hmm. that. Mm -hmm. a, a, a smart person mm -hmm. will always be ahead of anybody else if they have the ability to spot opportunities. That mm -hmm. is the key. If you can spot an opportunity before anybody else does and exploit it, those mm -hmm. are the new entrepreneurs that get the funding, get the, the those are the Facebooks, mm -hmm. those are the, the Apples. The ability to find a gap in the marketplace and to see an opportunity that no one else sees. Do I see something that no one else sees and can I exploit it? Mm -hmm. and, and exploit sounds like a dirty word to some people, but really it's not. It's basically, it's basically just finding a way to, to find a way to help people that other people are not using and utilizing at the moment. Absolutely. So, yeah. Exploit can mean using resources in a different way than somebody else mm -hmm. does. Yeah. Exploit can mean I'm saving money if I take this route as opposed to that route. So, you, you know, you have to take those blinders off. And I, like when I'm consulting my clients, Mm -hmm. And they come, a lot of my clients, I'm a business advisor to my clients. A lot of things that I see 
or just startups that I just really <laughs> tell them, listen, you don't want to do this. I'm trying to save you some heartache because uh, especially is really bad with professional athletes. Oh, they're the worst. Oh my really? God. Why? <laughs> oh, yeah. um, hmm. A lot of guys, and I don't know if it's the schooling they received, they didn't really get on the business side because they, mm -hmm. they, they obviously they were in school. They didn't get to study business like I did or say yourself. Mm -hmm. They tend to want to start things that are saturated in markets like, they want to have their own sneaker. They want to have their own clothing line. They want to mm. do a club. Yeah. They want to do, you know, stuff like that. And clubs are really bad businesses unless you're going to create a cheers. Where's membership only? Clubs, <laughs> the product life cycle on clubs is not very good. And, wow. Oh, mm -hmm. yeah. Why is that? Because people, yeah. you remember when, you're, when you start a club, people yeah. get tired of going to the same place and they want something different. Ah, so in essence, you'd have to continually revamp the place and give a new energy, new life, continually making it interesting. Absolutely, and, and yeah. then you, the, depending on who your market is, mm -hmm. you may want to target people that, uh, that are fluid, and people that are fluid don't go somewhere where all the commoners are, or the, the mere mortals, they want to go somewhere where it's exclusive because they don't want to be hassled. So mm -hmm. if you're trying to open a club, you cater to everybody, and you're trying to you're trying to make money. It's eventually the the, the product life cycle on that end, on that particular business is going to go down because clubs mm. have a very short product life cycle. Mm. And yeah. I, these guys are young. You know, you give a guy thirty million dollars and he's what twenty one, twenty two. <laughs> he's talking to him. He's not going to really feel you till he's on the end of, back end of his career. Mm -hmm. He's screwed all his money off and. Now, yeah. now he's a little bit more sane. Now he's a little bit more approachable. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and, and that brings me to mind. You mentioned earlier in the conversation risk. Have you noticed risk pattern? Could you mention risk pattern? What does that yes. mean exactly? And, and how do you begin to notice? Are, are you exhibiting some of those risk patterns in your own business? And how do you not do that? Sure. Uh, well, I obviously, when I did my research and I studied risk patterns and I didn't want, I was doing my own business, I had to go rethink and re, you know, realign my business because I was, I was looking at risk patterns in other business. A, a common risk pattern is uh, market saturation, which would be market climate risk. Mm -hmm. And if I, it's basically five, and I don't want to bore you to tears, I'll just give you a few of them. <laughs> market okay. climate means is the business, is it the right climate for the business? Can mm. the business, with the business, have a greater chance of being successful due to the market climate? You mm. have one called business environment risk, and this is a really interesting one. This, mm. and I, uh, I, at the time I was doing my research, I think Katrina had started in New Orleans or New mm. Louisiana. Well, how I came up with this is anytime you have a major catastrophe, Mm -hmm. It affects your business, especially yeah. a flood, a tornado, or a hurricane. Well, your business operations are ceased or, 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 or interrupted. So if your business operations are interrupted, you can't make money. Mm -hmm. So where your business is located is key. Now, another, the flip side of that, too, the business environment could also mean uh, are you, is your business vulnerable to terrorism? Mm. Like it, depending on where your business is located, is the business located in a country that has a lot of terrorism or part of the country that's under terrorist alert? Because mm. that means people don't want to go where you are, so you can't make money. Mm. Absolutely. Wow. Oh, yeah. Then oh, this go. <laughs> <laughs> That's that just excited me because we here at Savvy have realized that um, with a lot of the things going on with the internet, things are starting to shift. And we're yes. seeing that things in the near future could very much change for businesses that are online. So Absolutely. we start asking our, we start asking our clients, what, it is, what do you most need, what do you most desire in your business right now? And a lot of them are wanting that visual component to their interview. So we're starting mm -hmm. to move over to the video component and doing live mm -hmm. interviews and mm -hmm. primarily just radio um, because uh, if anything happens to you know internet or if a lot more laws are passed that make it difficult to do business on the internet we're now moving to a more um, physical um, mm -hmm. business so it, it's interesting that uh, when you mentioned that business risk uh, environment we're, we're noticing the environment's changing so how do we assess and, and change our business model to match what our clients both need and to batch and to also match the business environment coming up 
Oh, uh, that's a tricky, that's a tricky uh, dilemma because yeah. if you have a business that's headquartered in a place that has a, that has a, say, terrorist uh -huh. alert or something mm -hmm. like that. Yeah. Well, do you move the business somewhere secure or do you have the business decentralized to where the operations can remain intact and you just shift, the shift the operations to another location? Well, mm -hmm. most businesses are not capable of doing that. Yeah. So I would say you'd have to be very strategic in where the logistics and the location of the business, because yeah. that, that's critical. But also, another part of the business environment risk patterns is also is the business located in a high crime area. Mm. You, know, you have to deal with break-ins. You have to deal with uh, corporate espionage. Mm. Um, like, is a, uh, how, is a business protected? So your environment is really critical to your profitability. Yes, yes, I see all of this. And what's really good about the digital age, whether you're going to be on the internet selling or not, is that you do have, with the digital age, the option to sell soft versions of uh, whatever it is you're selling. I see now people are writing books. They don't often um, put them into paper form now. You can get it through Kindle or such uh -huh. or a digital format. So a allows print on demand, you know, exactly. unless somebody wants, because that mm -hmm. inventory costs money. Yes. And I have a I have a I have a a, a, a metric in my uh, risk research called customer turnover, mm -hmm. and the reason I came up with that is because some businesses don't have inventory, some businesses are, are services driven, and some businesses are not are client driven. So, mm -hmm. say getting back to your point, if you're if you're a, a publisher and you mm -hmm. publish I don't know a contract for a thousand books. And you can't sell those books. Well, uh, that inventory is costing you money because you have to pay to store them. You mm -hmm. have to pay to move them. So uh, this is, you know, the print on demand thing is the greatest thing since sliced bread because you don't, <laughs> it's like just in time inventory. The yeah. book is not printed until it's ordered. And then you incur, all, then you take all the costs off the, off the price of the book. Are you adding your cost to maintain your profit margin? So that's mm -hmm. wonderful. Ebooks even better, you know. Mm -hmm. I'm a avid, I'm a voracious reader, and I'm starting to have to rethink my knowledge. What am I going to do with all my statistics books? I don't know if I can look at those on a reader, but mm -hmm. I may have to. I'm going to have to um, mm -hmm. rethink that because e-books are probably the wave of the future. The way people are going, you pack everything on your on your uh, mm -hmm. iPad or tablet or whatever, and you yeah. take it with you. Like when I'm at the airport, then I have to go travel out of the, out of town. Well, I like to pack a book with me. Well, I could probably centralize that with a tablet. In the same books that I have, I, would, I could definitely read them on my tablet. This is just a different way for me to get used to that. I don't know yeah. if I, I – I'm just old school. I like to write in my books. I like to make comments. And that's, that's just – it's just a different animal. I'm sorry. <laughs> no, no, I get you. I get you, D'Anthony, because me, I, I like to feel the paper book in my hand. Uh-huh, yes. But – the Android here has become a great help because I get several people we interview per week, and a lot of them are book uh, authors, and they send me their book. And if they all mail them to me, I don't get them in time. So they send me a PDF. I load it up on my Android. I'm able to read it while I'm, um, you know, during the day and whatever. And it just allows mm -hmm. me to, um, as you said, get a lot more done quickly. Mm -hmm. and, and the Digital Age also offers another thing, which is repurposing of whatever your product is. Like we've gone out and done a, mm -hmm. done a lot of workshops. Once we've done a little workshop or a lecture or whatever and we have a bunch of speakers or, or a lot of our guests come out and do a talk on something we record them and then later have them for sale where you can buy them and hence have a soft version or um, hard copy of it but that way you're able to repurpose and, and have another uh, product for your business that is phenomenal uh, the, the the avenues in which you can disseminate information through channels is just you know Really, we're in the age of entrepreneurship with the digital, yes. with the uh, digital revolution or the digital economy. Mm -hmm. Really, you you can be you can actually keep your job and, and be a writer on the weekend and still publish your work and still get your work out and disseminated to the public. We have mm -hmm. new e entrepreneurs that are doing that, and you know yeah. it's a different. It's just a different animal. Just a mm -hmm. different animal. That, that's a great thing. That's a great thing. Yeah, and like one, one gal said to me, when I first got started with my financial consulting business, I was trying to force people to do it the way I wanted to. I was like, hey, 
I want to teach people how to be great financial resources of their own money and their own business, mm -hmm. and bam, uh, bring in that cash flow and such. Well, some of the entrepreneurs I dealt with were not really all that concerned with wanting to learn how to be a great financial guru and understand all of this themselves. They want to hire someone who's an expert on it and do it for me. You so, just uh, hit on something. Yeah, business is yeah. a team sport. Yeah. You can't do everything. Uh, mm -hmm. I'm, I'm great at marketing, terrible at accounting. <laughs> um, yeah. I, I I have to get an accountant. So yes, I, I totally get that. I tell, business is a team sport. You can't do it all. And especially if you're an entrepreneur, you're gonna have to outsource certain aspects of the business to maintain what you need to do. If you're not mm -hmm. good at accounting, don't try to learn on the job. I mean, you're just gonna make yourself get yourself in trouble with the government. So, yeah, yeah. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, a lot of people have tried to do that, and it makes their life a lot harder and difficult. It's not necessary. If you're not a web designer, don't build your own website. If you're not an accountant, <laughs> put through your own books. But I'm old like, school. <laughs> I, pay, I say I'd rather pay somebody, and yeah. I'll, pay, I'll eat the cost to get it done. I don't want to learn because that, that profit, you have to look at profitability. That time that you spend building that website, how many clients could you have gotten during that time? Mm -hmm. So you yeah. have to be strategic with your time. Like the, the, I, when I was teaching entrepreneurship at the university in a graduate class, I used, it was a little joke I used to tell. This lady saw on Saturdays her husband was laying up on, a, on the bed on the couch with a remote watching sports, and she just didn't like that. She says, you need to cut the grass. What does the husband do? Picks up the phone, calls his yard man, says, hey, can you get over here and cut the grass? Guy goes, yeah, I'll have a check under the mat for you. Yard is cut. Well, the wife is still not happy. Why is that? It's not about the yard. It was about she didn't like him being sitting on a couch not doing anything. <laughs> <laughs> yep, yep. Instead of just telling him the truth, be direct, eh? That's another yes, lesson. <laughs> absolutely. It wasn't about the yard. It was about she didn't like him not doing mm -hmm. anything. She just felt that a man should be working on Saturday. And that's, yeah. that's, I always tell that story, get a couple of laughs. Yeah, yeah. It goes to show communication sometimes. We don't always say what we mean and uh -huh. what we truly desire. And for initially, when you're starting a new business and you say you have this talent in mind with financial consulting and such, you have to decide what is it exactly my clients want and how do they want it delivered because most of the clients coming to me were women um, mm -hmm. who were maybe not very financially savvy. And my mentor said to me, hey, do they want you to do their finances perhaps? And if so then teaching them is not the great, the best model. Then they'd want you a do-it-for-me model. How could you do that? So it's like looking at it and finding out what, is it, what do they really want, asking the right questions. Oh, absolutely. Uh, mm -hmm. like, a, like when you go to a car lot and buy a car, you tell mm -hmm. a salesman you want this type of car and you want this type of color, but the guy keeps trying to sell you this other type of car, this other type of color. Well, he just lost the sale because he didn't listen to his customer. Mm -hmm. You know, sometimes, and I, and I know I'm probably, I've probably seen this with my clients, they, mm -hmm. sometimes they're trying to tell you something and they don't know what they want to tell you and they don't know exactly what they want until you show them something. Mm -hmm. So it's, 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 it, 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 it's a hit or miss. Yeah. Tell me, like, when you get a client, you say, well, tell me what I can do to make things better. How can I help? You? Yeah. Well, I'm having this, I'm having that. And if, oh, had you considered this? Because mm -hmm. a lot of people just need to be guided. Yeah. They may not know exactly what they want, exactly what they need, but mm -hmm. it's more of a guidance. You know, you got to play sometimes psychologist. How can yeah. I help this person and make it economically beneficial to me and get paid at the same time? So <laughs> I totally get that. Yeah, a win-win. <laughs> yes, it's a win-win. People, right. people pay for what they, what they want or what they need. Mm -hmm. They will pay you. You just mm -hmm. have to find a way to fix what they were to ask you to do. Yeah, and really decipher what it is they most need. Because what another interesting thing I found about some people will come to you is they'll say one thing that they need or want, but when you ask enough questions, the right questions, you find out mm -hmm. well what they really, really, really want, like the wife with the grass, uh -huh. is something different <laughs> than what they're actually saying. But it's you getting see that all the time. Oh yeah, you hit it right on the head. That is so common. <laughs> it's so common. So it's kind of like peeling back the layers and asking more and more questions. So you're like, ah, oh, so this is what you need for your bed. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you. Yes, you get uh -huh. me. Uh-huh. Yeah. Yes, exactly. So, go on. Go ahead. Go ahead. 
Yeah, I was just going to say now talking about demographics because we our demographics, as I said prior to you, is mostly women, seventy five to seventy percent women, mm -hmm. service based entrepreneurs. Do knowing and understanding your factors such as demographics, age, race, um, education level, is that all play in in the success of your business as well? Is that an important element? That is a great question, Christina. And let me tell you what I found out of my research: mm -hmm. gender and ethnicity. Uh, do not play a big factor in entrepreneurial risk or success. Mm -hmm. So if you're a woman, you still can be successful. You, the only risk that mm -hmm. I think that you may encounter is probably people who don't find your product useful or find your product appealing. That will be the only risk that you have. But women mm -hmm. can be just as successful as males if they put the right people around them. Mm -hmm. So uh, entrepreneur risk is genderless, and this is really has this. It does not have a bearing on ethnicity. Has mm -hmm. no bearing on those two things. Those were those were the two things that surprised mm -hmm. me when I was conducting research on the 500 businesses that I did research on. Mm -hmm. It actually inspired me hearing that because yeah. really, really, it's not about those two things. It's about you. So women can be. I'm expecting the next uh, female Mark Zuckerberg. That's getting ready to happen. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. And it, what surprised me, and, and I have a, a good friend whose dad has a very successful multi-million dollar company. He did not get to finish high school. He didn't come from this country, but mm -hmm. he came to this country without a high school diploma and as a millionaire, a multi-millionaire. Mm -hmm. So uh, that surprised me because you think that you need uh, sometimes a bunch of different Degrees behind you, race will matter, you'll think, maybe your I'm gender. I'm going to probably sound like a politician by saying this. Right, That's a great question. I believe that mm -hmm. in America, if you're doing business, remember, he came from another country. and he, yes. he, he Though there's two schools of thought. You have the school of hard knocks and you have the school of education. And both mm -hmm. of them are needed, okay? And mm -hmm. I, would, I would be wrong to say that you shouldn't have some type of uh, degree. Let me mm -hmm. tell you one of the big issues with, with and I've taught at the universities. Mm -hmm. The biggest thing that's the big deterrent to people that want to study business is they make you go through so many, I would say, meaningless classes. Mm. Like if you want to study marketing, you should be able to study marketing because mm -hmm. you have a need, you have a thirst for studying the, the, the craft of marketing, right? Why mm -hmm. should I make you take computer science and make mm -hmm. you take English and make mm -hmm. you take uh, – finance yeah you're going to get to finance and you get to it but if you the goal is to build on what you already have so if you tell me you want to you're curious about marketing and i make you take all these other classes that don't have anything to do with marketing well that's a strong deterrent mm -hmm. and a lot of y'all our universities haven't really figured that out yet business mm -hmm. the way they teach it at the university level is extremely hard you have to take at least 18 hours of math related courses mm -hmm. now I should be able to take accounting, one, to understand the basics of accounting, how to read a financial statement. I shouldn't mm -hmm. have to take three accounting classes, mm -hmm. you know, especially if I'm going to hire a CPA. Now, mm -hmm. if you want to study accounting, well, of course you need to take as many classes of, uh, as, as you need. So mm -hmm. the American school system in terms of university, colleges and universities, remember, mm -hmm. it's profit-driven. They don't yeah. want to admit that, but it's profit-driven. Yes. If I can keep you in school for four years, mm -hmm. I can pretty much predict my profits four years from now. Because to get the degree, to do, what they're selling you is the degree. Mm -hmm. the degree is, is the product. So for you to get the degree, you have to do this. You have to do that. And mm -hmm. a lot of, you know, you're getting students that are dropping out in the second or third year because uh, mm -hmm. some of the professors, and I've, I've, I've worked with them, some of the professors that are teaching these business courses have never ran a business, never never worked in the industry. Whoa. <laughs> oh, yeah. It's really, universities are having to rethink how they're hiring practices for professors. Mm -hmm. How are you going to have a guy tell you anything about market forces or, mm -hmm. or anything dealing with business that's never worked in the industry, mm -hmm. never had a real job, now I'm talking about away from the university, never mm -hmm. cut his teeth in, in the field. You know, you can't do that. Yeah. You know, and I, I, I hope this adage is not accurate. You know, this is no offense to some of the universities. The people mm -hmm. who can't do teach. Yes, yes. But here's the mm -hmm. thing. I always find that mm -hmm. book knowledge is important, but yes. it's got to be added with, 
with with experience because for me it's the the practical application of putting Uh that knowledge to the test that really you get it ingrained within you and tell me this is my dad he grew up in Germany Mm -hmm. and for for them it's very rigid there and what I didn't like about it is that high school exam to even get into high school is so rigorous that most people don't get into it and then you're Mm -hmm. forced to go into a what's called vocation thing you pick something oh yeah they track you right yes and then yeah mm -hmm. Yeah, and then you're kind of put into, okay, now this, you're an entrepreneur, uh, not entrepreneur, um, uh, what's it called, uh, apprenticeship. Apprentice. And you pick some, yeah, and you, and you do that thing. Well, part of me was thinking, what if you had a great talent, you're just a little slow, and bam, you're just knocked out because you didn't pass the exam. But on the other side of that coin, I thought, well, how cool it is that you get to really just focus on whatever you pick as your craft. Now, if you really know that's your love and it's something you really have a talent for, mm-hmm. now you get to focus 100% on just that craft and being an a, 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 um, apprentice of it. I'm of the opinion that you need both schools. I, I, you can't have a professor teaching you about marketing, and he's never worked for a marketing firm. He's never done any marketing. You, you yeah. probably know more about marketing than some of the professors that I work with. And that's a real tragedy because writing, think about this. You're writing journal articles, right? You're saying you're doing all this research. You're writing journal articles that nobody's ever going to read but you and your particular market because it's all academic. So Mm -hmm. we have to break the cycle of academics, academics, academics. You need academics balanced with with practical application because both both of them are needed. On the academic side, they call it practitioner. And Mm -hmm. they tend to be condescending in terms of practitioners. I think both schools of thought are needed. Like Dave Thomas that started Wendy's. Mm -hmm. I read his book, and he had talked about why you always keep your menu simple. Now, they don't teach this in marketing. This is totally from a guy off the street that has no business degrees whatsoever. He cut his teeth with Colonel Sanders. He -hmm. worked with Colonel Sanders. He said, you know what you do? You only have 12 or 13 items on a menu. You Mm -hmm. keep the menu simple. So when a customer comes in to buy uh, or order food, he already knows the menu. Mm -hmm. I never learned that in marketing school. Never learned that. That came from Dave Thomas. Mm -hmm. Interesting, right? Yeah, absolutely. Well, we're get, we're getting to the end of our talk here, and I don't want anyone to leave without finding out how to get your awesome book, Risk Factors and Business Models, Understanding the Five Forces of Entrepreneurial Risk. Let them know that, where they can find out more about you. Sure. You can order my book on uh, Amazon.com and uh, Barnes & Noble, and uh, my website, uh, www.mdicorpventures is my website, and I also have some other social media. I'm on Twitter. I'm on LinkedIn, and uh, if you'd like to connect with me, I would love to have you. And uh, I have a lot of things in the, in the oven getting ready to come out, and I'm working on two new books. My mm-hmm. next book is on forensic marketing. But Ooh. definitely, definitely, oh, yeah, great, great. It's going to be a great book. But yes, that's how you can get uh, access to my materials. Fabulous. And I'm just curious from my own uh, understanding, why did you choose MDI Corporate Ventures? Why did that become a name for you? What, what drew you to that name? You really want to know the truth? You, I'm I'll curious. make you laugh. <laughs> <laughs> I'm watching Iron Man, right? And I saw yeah. Stark Industries. Uh-huh. I said, I should call my company Miles Development Industries because uh-huh. my business isn't one thing. I can go into this area and I can go to that area. So if I'm doing, if I buy a business, well, my business is a holding company. It's the corporation. I said a business ex- exists as it is, but Miles Development Industries own the business. A Miles uh-huh. Development Industries Corp owns the business. That's how I picked my name. That's cool. Iron Man. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, Dr. Thought, D. Yeah. Uh, well, Dr. D. Anthony, it's been awesome talking to you today. Thank you so much for sharing this. Thank you so much. I enjoyed it. We have to do it again. This do, was awesome. Do. Yes, I can't sure. wait to read your other books. And uh, again, I want to thank you for coming to Savvy Business Radio and sharing your gifts and wisdom today. Thank you so much, Christina. I, thank you for having me. I really had a blast. Thank you so much. You betcha. Me too. Here's our interview with Taylor Hay of Synergetics Pocket Gym. Hey, Taylor. Welcome to Savvy Business Radio. How are you this morning? Just fine, Christina. I'm so blessed to have you out here. I mean, we took quite some time getting together. I'm so glad we finally were able to get our schedules in order and and meet up because you've done amazing work helping the world get healthy and and fit with your wonderful pocket gym and synergetics. It's a wonderful fitness program that 
I don't know if everyone in the audience has heard about, but tell us how you came to creating your passion and, and creating this wonderful fitness program. Well, it was bad luck and good luck, <laughs> or I should say a, a, a good prayer. Uh, mm. The bad luck was in the late 70s, uh, I was driving a red Porsche and uh, had uh, a house that had seven bedrooms in it and a great big subdivision because I was in business of uh, real estate and construction and development of land for 30 years. Mm. And in the late 70s, uh, uh, the Federal Reserve under Paul Volcker uh, ran the interest rates up to 23%. And I was paying, I was paying three over prime, so that was uh, 26%. And everything I was structured was 6%. So anyway, within 18 months, I went from a million two in the bank to 600000 in debt. Whoa. And so at that, at that time, I had two ex-wives. I sound like a, a bad boy, but I'm sort of nice. Mother says it was. <laughs> and, uh, uh, but I had two ex-wives that I was paying alimony to mm -hmm. and eight children, two in college, hmm. with, with no money. By then, I was uh, uh, taking uh, Valium Librium with scotch and uh, I had gained about 25 pounds and just felt like I was going to die. Wow. So I took off by myself and mm -hmm. uh, went to North Carolina rented a little shack on stilts overlooking the ocean and started trying to figure out how I could care for myself better so that I could face the reality that I didn't have any money and I had all this responsibility. So anyway, um, after about, oh, a few days, I knew how to eat. I knew how to do everything except one thing. I did not know how to exercise. Because hmm. I, had, I had literally, as a kid, destroyed my body exercising. Um, I played football when I was in grade school, high school, college, and uh, but I took those college exercises, which were jogging and machines and weights and all that kind of stuff, mm -hmm. and literally destroyed all the joints. And my father said, very wise man, that uh, your muscles are stronger than your joints. So I was using muscle, I had all kinds of muscle, mm -hmm. but I destroyed my knee joints, my shoulder joints, everything else. And uh, all of a sudden, I couldn't exercise anymore, and my muscle went away. Mm. So there was, I was fat, that I, I was 50 years old, fat and 50. <laughs> and, uh, so anyway, I was in the middle of one night, I woke up in the, in, on this little cot in this deserted beach, in that little shack on stilts, and read, running to the mirror, not running, I jumped out of the cot to the mirror, mm -hmm. and turned on a little, it was a 40 watt light bulb, you had a little piece of string on it, it was a cracked mirror, it's all dramatic, and mm. looked in the mirror, and uh, went through this one motion, and I smiled, and I said, thanks God, because I just prayed before I went to sleep, I said, God, I need help, I don't know how to do anything, please, so I went to sleep with tears behind my eyes, and mm. that's what happened, I had that dream that night, and so I went out to my favorite sand dune, and did synergetics, which is what they call it now. Mm -hmm. And I, I did I did these motions till the sun came up. And that was in 1980, mm -hmm. which was the beginning of what has now become a worldwide uh, exercise system that's practiced by mm -hmm. tens of thousands of people. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and what I found amazing about it is some of it re reminded me of a lot of exercises I've done in the past that are more prone to less harsh um, techniques against your body, like um, Pilates, um, Tai Chi, um, some of the moves reminded me of Tai Chi a little bit, um, you know, movements that really enhance the energy of your body and less hard impact, and I, I don't know about you, Taylor, but for me, for years, I felt doing exercises like yoga or Tai Chi or whatever, if I didn't sweat my pants off, I wasn't really getting a good workout. And, and that's, how, that's how I used to feel. Like if I'm not really sweating my pants off and, and feeling like I, I want to die, then I didn't get a good workout. And, and that's really not the best way to work out, is it? Well, I found out it was. <laughs> well, I, I, even though I played all these sports and I just love sports, I was built so I could play sports. You know, we're not all built the same way. Mm -hmm. And uh, I weighed 160 pounds when I played football in college, and uh, I weigh 160 pounds today. The mm -hmm. only difference is I've shrunk just a little, but I almost have the same muscle structure I had when I played college football, which mm -hmm. is strange uh, yeah. at, my, at my tender age of 86. And so anyway, mm -hmm. uh, I found 
that you do not have to sweat to be in perfect shape. In fact, sweat is not good because you're losing all your vital body fluids, mm-hmm. all the minerals and the vitamins and everything. And then what do you do to make up for the water you lost? <laughs> Gatorade, <laughs> yeah. you know, full of sugar, or water that's full of pollutants, or, or a, a good beer. I don't mind a beer. But, <laughs> but, the, but the idea is that you do not have to sweat to get in shape. And it's better for you not to sweat. I haven't sweated except when I'm outside in the sun mowing. Uh, I haven't sweated in years. Mm. And uh, you don't have to. Be, I could do synergetics and raise my heart rate of 60 points in 60 seconds. Wow. While, we're on, while I'm carrying on a conversation with you. Uh-huh. And then, and after I finish doing the synergetics, while I'm co- carrying on the conversation, I could stand up and talk to you without ever being out of breath. Mm. So what you do is you supercharge your body with mm-hmm. oxygen so that you're taking your heart along for a free ride rather than straining it so it has to beat for its life. Mm. Yeah, yeah. And it's interesting. Where did it come from in our society, the idea that we have to, you know, be on these machineries and stress our joints? Because, I mean, I did that myself. I would go running or go on the treadmill, and, and you feel like, hey, I'm getting a good workout. No pain, no gain, right? That's kind of a, a motto that's in the – you've heard in the exercise community – um, but I would find that I would have little to no results, and it would get frustrating. I'm sure a lot of people listening in feel the same way. For years, they've been hitting the gym or trying to do exercise programs at home and not really having the results they want. What really makes it different working with synergetics that is that you're not getting from a majority of the other fitness programs? Well, it's, it's, you, you've asked me two great good questions. <laughs> One, why did this happen? Yeah. Number two. Well, let's talk uh, just that first. It's called big business. Mm. There's no money in your learning how to do something that you don't know anything. You can use just your own body to exercise itself. Now, that, you can't make money doing that. I, don't, I hardly make any. I'm, the mm. products we sell, the DVDs and stuff, uh, are enough to so I can continue doing business, but it's not big business. The yeah. big business is Nautilus selling machines, uh, treadmills. Uh, they're all actually grinding your joints to pieces because they're single plane motions. Uh, uh, big business, number one, is the reason. Kenneth Cooper, who was the one that promoted uh, 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 running, you know, uh, Kenneth Cooper, and I, uh, a good friend of mine, wrote his books for him and mm. uh, uh, out in California and still does write books. He's uh, writing books on earthing now. Anyway, so Kenneth Cooper destroyed the bodies of countless people. And then was the first one to have a giant sports medicine center and wrote a book about how to uh, cure yourself in his sports medicine center from damaging your joints from doing all these exercises he promoted. Mm. So Kenneth Cooper had this, in Houston, Texas, had this giant sports medicine center. And sports medicine mm. is not for athletes specifically. They can't, mm. they can't make enough money. It's because people injure themselves doing all of these just body destroying exercises. Mm. That's why Tai Chi and yoga have yeah. been lasting all these years. They're they're uh, mm-hmm. uh, they're timeless. Yeah, and synergetics is timeless. Yeah. Yeah, and what was really nice about it that uh, you get also from yoga is really paying attention to the breath. Explain why it's so important to really pay attention to using your breath well, and and the importance of using it to work out. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. And synergetics is if you say, okay, Taylor. What would you say would be the best part of synergetics? Mm-hmm. I'd say, well, synergetics is an oxygen pump. Because the more oxygen you can get in your body every day, the longer you will live and the healthier you'll be. For instance, most people die of hypoxia, which Ooh. is oxygen, uh, uh, oxygen starvation of the cells. We're shallow breathers. Uh, we lose our posture, which means we hump over, which restricts the capacity of our lungs. And when we breathe, we do what I call the bikini breath. When you're walking down a beach, you, you <laughs> hold, your, hold your stomach in and you breathe in your chest. Mm-hmm. And the same with the men. Uh, these guys with these uh, six-packs you see on TV yeah. and, and, and the magazines. I asked a good friend of mine who knows all about this stuff. And I said, how do they do that? He said, it's very simple. They, they, uh, they go on uh, 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 diets, special diets, and starve themselves. And then they grease up and then they pose. Mm. You know, with no breath. That's that's where you get the six packs showing. They're they're in there, but they don't they show. And mm. the same with uh, our breath. 
we always think we should have our stomach relaxed, but the power of breathing, which I teach and share in Synergetics in the book and also the DVDs, mm -hmm. is very simply a complete breath. The same one when, when you said you were born, you were two pounds. Yeah. You were, you were, you were breathing with the complete breath. You were breathing. Uh, the lung has different capacity uh, mm -hmm. compartments, but you were starting and filling your breath from the bottom up like a glass of water. And uh, this is the way you're supposed to breathe naturally. Mm -hmm. But as we grow older, that's the way we normally would breathe when we were children. Mm -hmm. But as we grow older, we start stress breathing, which is just exactly like our parents do. But mm -hmm. if you look at a dog, anybody that has a dog, mm -hmm. just watch it when they're lying there sleeping. Their stomach goes out, then it goes in, out, and then in. And what you do is when you do this, you get two benefits. One, you get all this oxygen, which gives your trillions of cells a lot more life, and they last longer. Because, you know, we, we lose billions a day, and we get new billions, and they might as well come into a room that's not uh, polluted with carbon dioxide. But anyway, mm -hmm. so you inhale, and you're taking in all this breath, and then as you exhale, you contract your stomach muscles, which is singeing in your waist. Mm -hmm. For instance, I've had, uh, because, uh, let's see, that's 20... 36 years ago that I started Synergetics and started sharing it. Mm -hmm. At that time, I'd had a lot of women especially write me and say, you know, I haven't lost much weight, but I've got all these inches off. People will say, what have you done for yourself? <laughs> well, what, they've, what, they, what they've done is that they've lost the fat, but they've gained muscle, and muscle weighs more than fat. Yeah. Because these are, what, what these are, they are gentle, stretching, resistance motions standing in one place, power breathing, mm -hmm. with good posture, and uh, there, there's, there, I call it effective height. Yeah. Effective height is what, how you stand when nobody's looking. Mm. Have you ever thought about when you walk up and see somebody, you start standing up a little straighter? Yeah, yeah, okay. absolutely. All right, that's the, that's the way you should stand when nobody's looking. And uh -huh. so the reason why is because if you're straight up, then your lungs get more capacity to breathe. Your spine is straight so you don't get back problems because uh, by the time a person is 50, about 70% of the people have back problems. And this is all mm -hmm. because the spine is going lower and lower and lower. The mm -hmm. other thing, too, is that with the power of breathing, you, are, you have better skin, you have better digestion, you have better elimination, you have mm -hmm. better everything. So consequently, this type of motion Mm -hmm. exercises every muscle in your body simultaneously in a consciously controlled, mm. coordinated motion, period. Wow. And wow. it's done standing up. You don't have to lie down on the floor to kick and wiggle. <laughs> and do these really rigorous, uh, how do you call them, the stomach crunches stuff that makes you feel like, I mean, I did that but six months ago. I joined a gym, and I was doing these crunches. She had us do 170 crunches. Oh, and that's I, enough to kill you. That's I know. I got... Yeah, I got halfway through, and I almost wanted to puke. I was like, okay, not good. I need to stop. You should have just kicked him in the kneecaps and left and got your money back. <laughs> I, call, I, call those, I call those stiff body exercises. Here's mm -hmm. what here are the stiff body ones. Mm. Push-ups is mm -hmm. terrible on your spine because you're, you're bridging yourself from the tips of your toes. You mentioned something very important, too, about, you know, when a child is born, they use their full capacity of filling up a glass of water as far as taking in air. And it's interesting because when I studied opera in my 20s, one of the things my, my teacher said to me is when a baby screams, it's super loud. You're like, how does that little body make so much noise? And it's because he's taking in the breath all the way from deep into his core his stomach, like way into his diaphragm and pulling in all that air and then pushing it out. And, exactly. and yeah, and that's what we lose as adults. We, we forget how to do that, that we did so instinctively as, as children, babies, just pulling in all that air and poof, making that huge sound as a little teeny baby that's necessary so we can get fed and eat and all that jazz. But we, we lose that as we become adults, and that's one of the wonderful things that you teach people in synergetics is how to learn to get that back and to take in the full breath into your diaphragm and, and, and use the air and the breath properly. Yeah, that's, yeah, they call it diaphragmic breathing. Yeah, that's breathing right. diaphragm. But if you, if you watch a close-up of an opera singer, mm -hmm. you'll see them, their stomachs go out and then, boom, push them back in. Also yeah. good singers. Some of your good, uh, not country crooners, but I'm talking about the ones that, that would belt it out on the stage. 
just watch their chest and their stomach. And mm-hmm. uh, exactly the same thing. But the key is, is that oxygen is the life. Uh, I think uh, yoga is called the breath of life. It's a mm. good call. Right? Yeah. Or the complete breath. And so it's a matter of practicing this until it becomes a natural thing that you do in your life. Yeah. For instance, when I drive the car, I no longer have, for the last six years, I have not listened to the car radio. Mm. I, st- I sing. Yeah. I do my uh, scales. La, 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 la. <laughs> and I also do the breathing. And I, do the, uh, and I also do another thing, too. And this is what I love. It's, uh, it's a way to keep your tongue nimble. Regardless, because see, at my, at, I should not say at my age that I've lived long enough. A lot of my friends are talking like this now. Yeah, oh. yeah, talking like this. It's because they've lost the vocal cords because they don't exercise them. So I do two things: I sing, do the scales, and I also have an exercise for the nimble tongue that brings your voice out of your throat up mm-hmm. into the face. <laughs> and this forces you to learn how to speak and use your face as your diaphragm for projecting a beautiful voice. That's what you do when you sing in the opera. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So anyway, the, the key is that the power of breathing mm-hmm. with the motions that are coordinated and they're, they're, they're what you call bilateral, which means that you're getting as much exercise on one side of your body as you on the other. So wow. consequently, Within 18 months, it takes about 18 months, Mm -hmm. you will have a perfectly straight spine and you'll have almost a perfectly balanced body. You will have as much muscle on your less dominant side as you do on your dominant side. So consequently, it'll hold your spine straight in place. Mm -hmm. And if you do your posture, look up to heaven Mm -hmm. and then don't look down. Just look down your nose and keep your head up to heaven as high Mm -hmm. as you can go. Uh, straight up and then look down your nose, you'll feel a little pressure on the back of your spine. Hmm. Well, that's the way you want to do synergetics because in 18 months, you will actually be able to straighten out your spine and you will end up with more effective height. You'll end up with about an inch or an inch and a half more effective height, which is what you stand when the waist looks. Wow. And I think we want to mention to the audience what's really super jazzy about synergetics is that it doesn't take long to do the exercise. I would. Well, that's... <laughs> I'm glad you... How come you're so good? <laughs> you always you always take you you always take the words out of my brain that didn't come out of my mouth. <laughs> and I wanted to say is that synergization does not steal your time. Mm-hmm. Uh, actually, the time is 12 minutes. Mm-hmm. Time is the most precious thing we have. Not only the minutes during the day, but the years in our life. And mm-hmm. so, consequently, I developed it so that if you do 12 minutes before breakfast. Before you put any kind of carbohydrates in your bloodstream, like a, oh, any kind of breakfast, that your body will finally say, oh, I need glycogen, which is a technical name, glycogen, so I can contract my muscles comfortably. Mm-hmm. Well, where am I going to get it? Well, I'm not going to give you my fat because I'm saving that for a famine that never comes. And so finally the body says, okay, I'll give you my fat. Mm-hmm. So consequently... If you do it 12 minutes before breakfast with a big glass of water, I drink a big glass of lemon juice and another glass of water before, before I do synergetics. Then what happens is your body will start taking your fat and converting it to muscle. Mm. And the reason you tr- the endorphins trigger appetite, uh, my theory, is mm. that when you were hunters and gatherers, the hunters would always be out hunting hungry. And mm. they had to restrain themselves from diving after them something that might eat them or run away, you know. And so consequently, their exercise they were doing was triggering endorphins and giving them a very controlled system where they had a cool head. Mm -hmm. So you trigger endorphins, which cuts your appetite for breakfast, Mm -hmm. and then you have a good metabolic rate of about 15%, maybe 20% for a part of the day. And as it drops, then after you've eaten dinner, which is your... See, we're supposed to eat like a queen for breakfast, a, pr- a princess for lunch, and Cinderella for supper. You know, <laughs> yeah. Uh, but it's the other way around. They mm. people very eat very little for breakfast, much 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 fast, a little for lunch, and then they great big dinner that doesn't get digested. So mm. what you do is you do synergetic again for twelve minutes. 
sometime before bedtime. I do it sometimes sitting down in a chair watching television. Then this increases your metabolic rate again, but it gets rid of a lot of stress so that you'll sleep better. People with sleep apnea, there are two clinics, sleep apnea clinics that recommend Cerogenics because it keeps them from storing and they sleep better. The total amount that you have to do with Cerogenics in a week is 12 minutes before breakfast and 12 minutes before bedtime. Mm. And that's a total of two hours and 48 minutes a week. That's about what it took you to go to the gym and do your sit-ups. Yep, just that. So here's the key. Make it a personal reference. You played the a mean violin at one time, correct? Yes, I did. <laughs> yeah. Do you still? No. No, I gave it up years ago, actually. Oh, yeah. but you, that's one of the best things you could do is either sing to bring the angels in and relax you or play a musical instrument. Dr. Mm-hmm. John Diamond said that any person that's alive today should learn to play a musical instrument, even if it's a kazoo, because it balances the body, it balances the mind, and it gets rid of stress. So anyway, mm-hmm. now, like a Stradivarius, we need tuning every day. How many times did you, when you had to play a piece, let's say you were at a recital, mm-hmm. you tuned your violin more than once, didn't you? Um, depending, yeah. I mean, if it depended on how long my, my, um, my gig was going to take, whether it playing one or two songs or if I'm playing an hour or a half hour, I could end up tuning it a couple times. Okay, yeah. The mm-hmm. same with your body. Consider this. We're, we're more intricate and more beautifully put together than a Stradivarius. Yeah. However, we don't tune our body during the day. It was synergetics, for instance, right now, I'm doing synergetics while I'm talking with you. I'm, I've, I've got my hands locked, and I'm shifting my weight back and forth, I'm mm-hmm. doing the power of breathing, and now I'm going to do the fantastic faces. <laughs> I'm getting rid of stress, I'm getting relaxed, I'm mm-hmm. developing my muscle while we're talking, for goodness yeah. sake. And I'm in yeah. a little swivel, little funny little office chair, yeah. and I'm just... Uh, doing this, but the idea is if you tune your body every day, regardless of how you're dressed, I'm dressing a pair of shorts and a t-shirt right now, but uh-huh. I, used to, I used to demonstrate synergetics in black tie on mm-hmm. stage just to prove that you could do it anytime and anywhere you were, any way you were dressed. Mm-hmm. For instance, Joanna's done it high heels. She'd be uh, sort of tired before we'd go out for the evening, mm-hmm. some party. She'd, do, she'd be in high heels. She said just a minute, she would do synergetics fully dressed, mm-hmm. you know, because it doesn't pull your shirt tail out. And it doesn't make you sweat. And it makes you, oh, fantastic faces. Uh, <laughs> if yeah. you do fantastic faces for 18 months, this isn't a 10 day makeover. In 18 months, people will accuse you of a facelift. They'll mm-hmm. say, What have you been doing? Have you been starving yourself to death? Because you'll lose a pound a week, guaranteed, if you do synergetics before breakfast for 12 minutes and before bedtime for 12 minutes. Guaranteed a pound a week permanently if you keep doing synergetics. And you'll re- in 18 months, you'll reach your ideal weight. As uh, everybody blames menopause and all these other things on, oh, that is this, uh, on, on gaining weight. But you mm-hmm. don't have to gain or keep it. You, could get, you don't get rid of it. What you do is replace it. This thing of fighting fat is the quickest way to get fatter. You don't mm-hmm. fight it. You love it because that fat's going to be converted to beautiful, beautiful contoured muscle that will keep you balanced so you don't fall down and break your hip. It will keep you up straight so that you have effective height of about an inch or uh, half an inch or an inch more. Mm-hmm. And this is great. So, I don't want us to leave here. We're going to have to end our time together. We are coming to the end. But I don't want people to leave without finding out how they can get your awesome program. Sh- share that with them. Pocket Gym, P-O-C-K-E-T, just like p- pocket, pocket book, Pocket Gym. Mm-hmm. Like a gymnasium, G-Y-M, pocketgym.com, P-O-C-K-E-T-G-Y-M.com. And then you'll see what I look like. Uh, the, the, the most current picture in there is uh, one when I'm standing in the valley of the life-changing dream, which is a story in there. And I've, I was 84 when that picture was taken. So you say, oh, let me see what that guy looks like now, not what he used to look like. And so, uh, but pocketgym.com. And uh, you can order online if you choose to order anything. Or if you want to email me, I'll be glad to answer any questions you have. You betcha. And it's it's so important. You'll also get to see on, on the um, website what the exercise look like. But more importantly, what's very important to, to leave with here is just that people realize that if you've been wanting to make change, you don't need to do super drastic things that are 
very harsh on your body. This is very gentle. It doesn't matter if you've had issues with exercise before, if your joints hurt and you have trouble exercising. The doctor says, like, my, my partner has um, a lot of arthritis issues. It's a great low-impact exercise for everyone that takes very minimal time that you can add into any day, regardless of children, family, work, or whatever might be. So again, uh, Taylor, I want to thank you for coming to share this very important exercise program with our audience today. And, and thank you for sharing your gifts and wisdom today on Savvy Business Radio. Well, all I can say, Christy, is you made my day because I feel much better now than I did when I started. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, Taylor. You're welcome.